to everyone watching from around the globe, good day. My name is Vignesh and welcome to this, the third and final episode of the Head Foundation's webinar series, Educational Leadership in a Crisis. Over the last two weeks, we have explored issues around mobilizing one's community and nurturing one's educators in this time of crisis. We have heard from school leaders in the region and eminent educational experts on how we can go about engaging our community, working with our educators, working with our networks, and working with others to ensure that education continues and it continues in the highest of quality during this time of crisis. Today, in our concluding episode, we look at the most critical component and the most important stakeholder in education, the children. The reason most of us choose the profession that we find ourselves in is to serve our youth, is to provide them opportunities that some of us may not have had in the past, and is to ensure that we build global citizens, citizens who are genuinely concerned, not just of their own well-being, but of that, of those around them and of this planet. We commit our time, our effort and our energy in educating our youth because we believe that they will be better than we are and they will be greater custodians of the gifts that we have. So today is my great honor to introduce our panelists who will be discussing about what they have been doing as school leaders to care for their students during this crisis. Many of us think about the learning loss and are concerned about it. But beyond that, a pandemic and the lockdowns that come with it places great stress and burden on these young children. Imagine us as adults, our stress, are confined and face cabin fever having to work and do our daily chores from home. What more for children? Children who are generally social beings, who enjoy spending time with their classmates and their peers are now forced to stay at home. They are made to learn lessons online and many of them may struggle. And the situation is so different in every single country. Technology may not always be available, and they may not always have the resources or the conducive environment at home to learn. So today, our speakers will share more on their perspectives. And it is my great pleasure now to introduce, without further ado, the moderator of this series, and of course of today's session, Associate Professor Vicente Reyes. Vicente, please. Hello, everyone and welcome to the third and final webinar of our three-part webinar series that looks at educational leadership during times of a crisis. Do not go where the path leads you. Go where there's no path and lead the way. These words from the poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson, appropriately fits our set of speakers today. In a time of pandemic, as Vignesh reminded us in his introduction earlier, we are blessed to have with us two practitioners and one academic who specializes in educational leadership. These three colleagues, friends of ours, will share how they navigated an uncertain path and created their own way towards understanding and addressing particularly the challenges that the young learners, our students face. We have as our speakers first uh, would be Jaida, but I will be providing the more detailed introduction for her before she begins her presentation. So let me open by introducing Carolyn she is currently the principal of 
Chuchi School in Jakarta, Indonesia. Caroline is an experienced school principal with a demonstrated history of working in the education management industry, ranging from preschool to high school. She obtained her undergraduate degree from the Atmajaya University with a focus on psychology and then completed her master's degree in educational leadership at the De La Salle University in the Philippines. She used to be working with primary schools. That was her first encounter with the head foundation at with us from the University of Queensland then, but now she's assigned to the secondary section of Chuchi, Chuchi School. The critical friend for our third webinar is Dr. David Ang. He is an associate professor at the National Institute of Education. He serves as the Associate Dean Academic Quality at NIE Singapore. He provides overall leadership management and improvements in academic student and programs quality. David's area of expertise, among many others, is in complexity leadership learning. And this is something that is really important for us, for all of us today in these contemporary times when we experience what people have referred to as volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous contexts. Before we proceed with uh, Jaida, our first presenter today, I'd like to just invite everyone to participate in a poll. So I'd like to read out the poll question that we have for all our participants. How best can we extend care to young people during crisis? Do we regularly communicate with and directly address issues troubling students? Do we increase engagement with parents? Do we prioritize the well-being of learners over and above academic progress? Or you might think that you're confused and unsure of what steps to take. So I invite all our listeners, our friends from different parts of the world to participate and choose your response to this poll. Before we start our Q&A at the end of this webinar, we will be sharing with you the results of this poll. I now introduce our first speaker for this final webinar. She is Jaida Malonzo, currently school principal at Batino Elementary School. Jaida has had a rich international experience having participated in the Leaders and Educators in Asia program in 2005, and then having completed a certificate in educational studies and leadership with the Head Foundation and the University of Queensland. Batino Elementary School is a, a kinder and primary school, and it's also a designated special education center of the Department of Education. Jaida, can you kindly share with us your insights as to how we navigate and care better for our students? Thank you, Dr. Mentor, Dr. Vicente Reyes. Good day to all the educators and participants from around the globe. Telling people you're in the business of ed reform can set up a wide range of responses from curiosity to skepticism to outright hostility. It's understandable, of course, that this would happen. Being a global citizen, I prefer to talk about transformation and how it can happen as painlessly as possible for the benefit of all. My trainings in Temasek, my experiences as an exchange teacher in South Korea, and my scholarship program with the CSL opened my mind and soul to global citizenship education and how can we globally transform our educational system. As we become aware of the increasing complexity and contradictions in our world today, we need to rethink the role and relevance of the system. We need transformative education that can help people cope with the realities and demands of a rapidly changing society. We need education that is not only about gaining new knowledge and skills, but also about valuing life and social harmony in this diverse world. It is in this slide that this program, Bridging Connections Through Sign Language, Hands in Action, Then Love in Motion, is conceptualized and implemented for the welfare of the clientele of Batino Elementary School, Special Education Center. My school is coined as the first education center in Quezon City, Philippines. As I read from its history, this is my third school assignment, 
staying here for one year and two months already. Currently, 29% of our pupils with special needs, while the remaining 71% are regular students. There is only a 1% increase in its enrollment compared last school year, basically due to the pandemic. Our school offers separate classes for children with intellectual disability, deafness, autism, and visual impairment. What are the key issues in this program? First, the enrollment of children with deafness or hearing impairment. This ranks second in the children with special needs in my school. There are 220 when I started the program. The most numbered is the intellectual disability with multi-level enrollees. Second is deafness, third is autism, and the last is visual impairment. Deaf learners from kindergarten to grade four are handled with special education teachers equipped with the sign language competencies, while the deaf learners from grades five and six are mainstream in general education or regular classes, which are handled by a general education teacher with assistance, of course, of a teacher interpreter. Second, the communication and schedule of parents. What triggered me to prioritize the children with deafness or hearing impairment is the personal experience I have as a school head in dealing with my deaf learners and one deaf utility worker. Inability to express what I want to say prompted me to think of a project that would be beneficial not only to me as the school principal, but, uh, but to everybody interacting with the deaf learners as well. Also, gathering the parents or other family members with their different business schedules is really a challenge. However, allowing them to realize the importance of the program somehow swings the difficulties behind. For those who cannot really make it physically to attend the sign language session in school before, are sent with video lessons for them to learn and cope also. So even before the pandemic started, we already communicated using the social media platform. The third, bullying cases among and between the deaf and the general education learners. This is seemingly alarming because of miscommunication. In my perspective, these children really need a lot of patience and understanding because they think and feel that other people are not understanding them, getting fun of them and the likes. Hence, they resulted to some unruly activities that probably seek attention. This problem was lessened during the last quarter of the school year because regular and deaf learners have time to interact with one another during the time. This is the way they communicated before between their paper and pencil and their budget part. But after and during the program, they can now use the signs they learn and I'm happy with that. The implementation of the program is doing. I proposed the program to my division supervisor and coordinator in the school's division of Quezon City, Philippines. Then a meeting was set with the Philippine Deaf Federation through its president, Ms. Caroline Degani, followed by a series of meetings with my internal and external stakeholders, with the family members, my teachers, and of course, the children, both regular and the deaf learners. And both I, this is my project. During the pandemic, this is the way we communicate. Due to the restrictions, the program is continued through the weekly uploading of the video lessons, the design language thread created basically for the purpose. This is also the platform where they send their videos and photos while studying design language together at home. Also, pupils who graduated were taught to also upload videos and share in the group. Parents who also learned already also share the same in the thread. Video conferencing is done at least once a month or as the need arises or whenever a pupil wishes to see me. During the pandemic, this is how we help them also. The series of food augmentation or the Panta with COVID food packs from Ateneo de Manila University Loyola Heights campus greatly helped our school learners and their families survive in some ways. As a school leader, I personally visited them in their respective barangays and homes to distribute the food packs. The sixth wave food distribution gave me the opportunity to get to know my school learners and their families more. I witnessed how they cope with the pandemic. I felt so much appreciation to the parents for exerting magnanimous effort and time 
bringing their special children to school despite the very far distance of the residence to Batina Elementary School just to get the appropriate education they desire for their children. I also visited our school learners in orphanage and foundations. The fatigue and fear of catching the virus didn't enter my thoughts upon seeing so much happiness in their faces, surprising me and my staff and the food packs we brought for them. This great opportunity to see them in these trying situations helped me internalize ways and means on how education must really continue for them. If I will give up, or else will assist them. Also, various webinars, links of various webinars on mental and psychological wellness from the Department of Education Philippines, the School Division Office of Quezon City, and other private organizations were also forwarded to the children and their family members to help them cope mentally and psychologically. In every program, there are obstacles, and here are mine. First is the very strict guidelines of the Philippine Deaf Federation with regard to the conduct of the Filipino Sign Language Sessions. Though it is already a law signed by President the 30th last 2018, still we are awaiting for implementing rules and regulations from the Department of Education. I did not wait for that. Thus, I focus on sign language and not the Filipino sign language only. Nowadays, if there are reteaching to do, then we are more than willing to do it. Second, the availability of the deaf instructor to conduct the sessions is prolonging the implementation of my program before. Further, the professional fees for their operational expenses is also an added provision that needs careful budgeting and logistics. Due to these constraints, I taught my teacher interpreters to help me with my program. Outsourcing of resources from generous officers, members of the School Parent Teacher Association, and using the available school funds I have made the program possible. What are my key learning points? First, I have more engaged internal and external stakeholders because most of them have children with special needs, so their heart belongs to mine in the project. Second, this program does not only teach them, we touch them and transform their lives eventually. Third, we cannot give what we do not have. As equipping myself with the sign language competencies is a great task. It is flattering to hear and to know that in the history of the school, I am the only school head who tried to study sign language. It is a sacrifice indeed, but I need to spare time to personally monitor the program and gradually learn the competencies myself. The lessons I've learned, first, be ready to take the risk and its consequences. As school leaders, we should be risk takers. If I did not take the risk, I will not have a program like this. Second, I made my faith larger than my fears and my dreams bigger than my doubts. I experienced this during the COVID food box distribution during the height of the pandemic. Third, our strength lies in being a part of a community. We do not live without relationships and we should never forget that. We have a very caring and shared connection between us. And it's amazing to see how we stick together at times. Sharing is caring. I would like to end my presentation by quoting what former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, and it quotes, good education is more than an entry point in the job market. Education is the power to transform people and bring shared values to life. In the face of global pandemics, conflict, climate change, and economic turmoil, it is clear we sink or swim together. We must forge a new way of relating to each other as individuals, communities, and countries. Education can cultivate in us a vision that sees beyond one's immediate interest to the world at large. It can give us a profound understanding that we are tied together as citizens of a global community and that our challenges are interconnected. Thank you very much for listening and for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Jaida, for sharing with us the challenges, the risks you faced, and for also enlightening us as to the reward that you were able to reap from taking these risks. I actually want, I'm actually really very inspired by what you shared with us, this idea of leadership by example, learning how to use sign language and being one of the first to do that is actually a lesson that all leaders can learn from by 
with, with what you just shared with us. Let me now call on our critical friend, David Ang, to ask you a couple of questions, maybe give you his reactions to your presentation. David? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jaida, for sharing uh, the intervention and the program. I am also inspired. And you made two important points, which I would like to uh, probably ask you to elaborate a little bit uh, more or think a little bit deeper. You mentioned about the importance of learning together and it's still happening in this crisis. And the other point is that learning together is actually uh, limited by your availability of deaf teachers in a way where because the uh, being able to teach more is that you don't have the expertise of the teachers. I'm just wondering whether if you could uh, think a little bit more about how do you expand learning together and tapping on resources beyond the teachers that are trained, who are trained. Actually, nowadays, it's difficult to tap resources from the outside, outside the school. So what we did is to really tap my school parent teachers association officers. And then I have one uh, great um, in stakeholders, the Rotary Club of Quezon City and Loyola Heights and the Inner Wheel Club. They're the one helping me a lot with regards to my special education programs. So re we really help together. We learn together because their hearts belong to special education. And then my teachers, we always uh, meet at least once a week or twice a month to really uh, spend time what's really in need for my special education students. Yeah. Yeah, I was just well, wondering whether, you know, you could also expand the thinking and look at not just only teachers and parents and a broader community as resources to help in the learning, the, the social learning and the support of uh, special needs children. But what about the children themselves, those who are, you know, probably at a higher level, uh, maybe an older student like a buddy system or, you know, pairing up or a group where uh, they already have the ability to do sign language. And then of course, taking care of the younger students who are, are struggling in their learning of the language as well as of course, the social part of it, which is the, uh, the, the, the being listened to and being, uh, being given good advice and so on. Your thoughts on that? Yes, they're actually, we are, we are students who, also, who already graduated and who are still with us, but have learned a lot of sign language already, are the ones teaching their fellow students in Batina Elementary School. And then they also, the one teaching their parents themselves, because parents have the difficulty learning the language by hands. You know, if your fingers are too difficult to bend, you know, we teach them that. And then these children, the higher age children, they do that for their parents and their uh, fellow students. Thank you, thank you, Jaida. Jaida, thanks also for um, responding to those questions of, of David. Um, one of the recurring questions that we have been receiving about uh, children during the pandemic is, how do we actually know that, we are that they are learning? Um, we are distanced from them. In the classroom, we're able to see whether they learn, but in a scenario where teachers are far from them, what concrete steps do you take, uh, tips, in order for you to be assured that our young learners are actually learning in, 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 the, in schools or in their homes at the moment? Yes. Actually, uh, there, there are children who are uh, sending me private messages requesting for me to accept their friend request. And then it's, it's time for me to accept because it's, it's a form, it's an informal assessment for me to know whether or whether they are learning or not the sign language I uploaded in their sign language chat. And they responding positively because they are showing me the video. I have another one, my teacher interpreted interpreter mom, Sonia Ladada is always with me. So we have group chat together. So we're calling through messenger and then the, 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 child, the, the child is doing the sign language. Mom Sonia is asking for a, a is telling a sign language, showing a sign language, then the children is following. So just like that. It's an informal, very informal evaluation and how I can assess whether they're learning or not. Thank you, Jaira. Let me read a couple more questions from uh, our participants. Uh, Marcus and Maria have sent their questions and I invite all the other 
participants, listeners, to just share with us your questions. So Marcos is asking, um, how do you actually manage problems, uh, behavioral problems on the part of some of your students, uh, particularly in, in this uh, pandemic? And another question that he has is, how do you manage problems that may occur and may come from parents? And then I'll read the question from Maria later on. So could you help us with that, uh, Jaida? Uh, although it's, it's not a bit difficult for me because I'm a, I'm a side graduate also. So I think being placed in this school is also a requirement, being a psychology graduate. It's, it's not difficult for me to understand them during the face-to-face -face interaction, but through this pandemic, we, all, we, all, we have the social media platform. Mm -hmm. If a student wishes to ask me, Mom Jaida, can I call you? Can I message you? I, or I easily accept. And then, is there a problem? We, I ask them. Then video, cuts, video call starts, and then they will start showing signs, especially the deaf learners. And then I will ask the assistance of a teacher interpreter because I'm not well versed yet. So that's how we communicate and help them together, especially if the problem is family issues. And then with the parents, mostly uh, what they're asking is how they get the load, the mobile data on how to continue the uploading of the video, learning the video I send them. So if I have spare financial, you know, I send some parents also. One final question uh, from Maria. You may have already mentioned this, but maybe you can elaborate further. What tangible support do you provide to kids with special needs in your school? Come again, what? The tangible support that you provide to your kids, especially during the time of the pandemic. Or is there any tangible support that you provide them? Yes, on the height of the pandemic, when it started last March 17, we are so lucky enough to be included in the uh, food augmentation program of Ateneo. Uh, after, one after a week, I received the 250 packs from them. So that's why I'm telling, I have told you a while ago, I distributed them by myself together with some selected teachers. And then during the sixth week, I did that together with them. And then some parents come here personally uh, uh, following health protocols to seek personal assistance actually. In that way, I cannot really deny helping them. Yeah, you really need to get from your pocket sometimes. Yeah, it's a part of leadership. Again, that's very inspiring, Jaida. Um, we will have an opportunity to ask you a couple more questions, which we are receiving in the Q&A chat box. But now we will need to proceed to our next speaker. Thank so you. Um, thank you again, Jaida. Let me call on uh, Caroline, the principal of Chu Chi School, to share with us uh, her experiences in how she cares for our students. Caroline, please. Thank you, Vicente. Uh, good day, fellow educators all around the world. Thank you for joining the session and thank you, the Head Foundation, for this good opportunity. So yes, allow me to introduce a little background uh, about my school, uh, the school that I've been working in for 10 years. But this is the first year that I assumed the role as the secondary school principal. I was with the primary school children uh, for nine years, so it was very interesting. My school is built upon a strong educational philosophy under the guidance of our founder, Master Chung Yen. She is based in Taiwan. So her philosophy is uh, we need to educate children, learners, not only in the mind, but also uh, to educate the soul. Therefore, talking about caring for your students, about the students' well-being is really something that attracts my attention during this time. And since my new role is to care for the teenagers, I think it makes it even more interesting. So yeah, when we talk about students, of course, we talk about uh, learners from different age groups, starting from early childhood, kindergarten, up to secondary or high school. We could say that uh, this time, most of the school age children, well, not only children, actually this pandemic uh, has been having a big impact on all of us. Yeah, but school age children are really affected by this. And people experience like fear or anxiety everywhere, little things such as 
um, doing the grocery shopping, visiting friends can seem very dangerous or uh, very uh, making you feel scared at this time. Well, this uh, can somehow be the source of stress of young people, you know, as young, uh, young people normally always feel invincible, right? But uh, this time, they're also uh, facing a lot of stress. They are adjusting to the online learning. It might sound okay in the beginning, but because it has been ongoing for like six months or so, then it becomes something stressful as well. They are adjusting to that and then they could have lost a lot of opportunities such as uh, teenagers who plan to uh, go overseas to, for uh, further studies or they could also lose some traditional milestones that they have planned in their life. So yes, they are experiencing a lot of stress. Uh, although us as adults, we adults, we have enough stress or pressure uh, during this time and we tend to overlook we tend to overlook the stress that the uh, children have at this time. However, uh, we need to acknowledge the stress that they're facing right now and do what we can uh, to support them. As the future is considered precarious, we probably have bigger challenges to overcome uh, post-pandemic. When things return back to normal, we don't know um, what is going to happen. What, what kind of children, what kind of students, what kind of learners are we going to have in the school? Imagine these bunch of teenagers whose developmental task is to interact with their friends, with their peers, were kept in isolation for months. We do not know whether they will face uh, this social anxiety when they return to uh, the real normal setup of interaction or social life or inability to interact uh, with others. And as we can see that I think this will still go on for quite some time. And we realize that it is no longer a sprint. It is a marathon. It is a long-term uh, journey. Therefore, in my school, we design programs to ensure students' well-being. We would like to make sure that their well-being are taken care of. So a little background on my school. Yeah, I was also very inspired uh, with what Jaida was sharing and how much uh, she is willing to go the extra mile to provide the best education uh, for the learners. In our school, we are trying to develop the strong support system to ensure their well-being. Our school is implementing international curriculum. We use the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge International Examination for our primary school and International Baccalaureate for senior high and also senior high school. So our program, we started uh, at first, we believe that we need to check on the students' well-being during uh, this distance learning. It's true that uh, during the remote learning, it is very difficult to connect, to have, the, uh, to have personal touch uh, with the students. Therefore, we conducted a well-being survey to check whether they're okay, whether they're fine. The responses uh, were were very, uh, there were different uh, responses. Most of them said that they feel bored, they missed coming to school, and, but uh, generally they're actually quite fine. And then uh, the school counselors, uh, they're also very important at this time. They work very hard to design programs and lessons that will address the students' needs. And because uh, this is a marathon, it's no longer a sprint, so we believe that resilience is something uh, very important uh, for these students uh, to have because these students need to have the ability to positively adapt to the challenges that they're currently facing. They need to face the, adver uh, the adversity and they need to be uh, resilient. So the lessons, uh, we designed the lessons about resilience and it vary from stress management, journaling activity, instilling growth mindset. These are all conducted by the school counselors and support the, uh, supported by the teachers. Then we also believe that normally the students will have different support systems. They come to school, they have friends, they have teachers, they have other life outside of the house. But now most of them are at home. So we believe another strong support system that should be built will be the family. I think that could be uh, one of the most uh, crucial support system that the 
that needs uh, to be built. And we have to make sure that the students also have a strong support system at home. We try to conduct uh, parent seminars and also activities. We intend to build strong uh, relationship between parents and children. Again, the context here, because uh, we're dealing with teenagers, yeah, sometimes it is a little bit uh, different when kids uh, reach their teenage years, they're no longer as innocent or as carefree as they were when they were very young. So they could, at this age, they could be having a big impact because of this uh, lockdown, because of this quarantine. Uh, and parents start to let go, right? Uh, the kids are no longer as clingy as uh, they were when they were young. Then children at this age, teenagers, they actually also prefer friends uh, to family, but at this time it is not possible. That's why it could be a stressful experience for them. Oftentimes when the children reach their teenage years, the communication with parents can also be uh, a little bit affected. Sometimes they need some special tricks, not to mention that not every student, not every child comes from a very supportive family. There are a variety of uh, backgrounds as well. So basically the school is trying to facilitate throughout many ways. During the online learning, we incorporate lessons about resilience uh, to teach to the children. Additionally, we also facilitate, uh, facilitate the students' interactions through virtual platforms. So like the school counselors, we set up rooms uh, consisting of uh, some students and we just let them talk to each other freely without having uh, the boundaries that, oh yeah, we need to discuss about the lesson. They can just talk because they need to just uh, interact uh, with their friends, even though they cannot see each other face to face, but at least this uh, virtual background, uh, this virtual platform can, uh, can help them. Then we also do another well-being survey to check again on their well-being. And I think this is definitely not the end, although we could say that this is a kind of a post-test, but uh, the cycle will continue. We will look again what is needed uh, uh, by students. Then we could also design another programs that will address their needs. So the key people in this uh, implementation are, of course, uh, the parents and the students. Yeah, because uh, the parents and the teachers, I'm sorry. Because, uh, and I like the idea that parents and teachers, we were once, we are adults and we were once children, we were once teenagers. So at least we could try to understand them more. And moreover, the emotional reaction of children at any age, including adolescents, is in part a reaction to what they see from the parents and caregivers they are surrounded by. So. Like what Mom Jaida was saying a while ago, you cannot give what you don't have. Teachers to teach resilience, uh, teachers need to be uh, resilient teachers as well. This teacher needs to be able to manage their stress as well. So uh, as part of our professional development training, we're, we're not always talking about the technicality or techniques of teaching, unit planning and stuff like that. But instead we also do well-being journaling. We want uh, teachers to also uh, be grateful to focus on the positive and to bring positive impact to uh, the learners. And for the parents, we also conducted uh, parent seminars. We would like to have more parents uh, engagement because especially during this time, uh, the kids are at home. So it's very important for parents to be a good partner uh, with the teachers. So these are the sample of the activity that we did. Uh, this was the a flyer of the previous uh, parent uh, parent seminar, and yes, we were also uh, we also designed the resilience race. This is a culminating event. Uh, the children, the students were actually very happy to participate in this. They said, "Finally, there is something." Uh, when we go online, it's not always about the lesson. Uh, they could do some games, although the result is of course not as good as if. Uh, we can do it offline, but this is an exposure uh, for the students, uh, for them to uh, exercise their uh, cooperation and collaboration with others and to think also creatively and to show that they're willing to overcome the challenges. So uh, those are the activities uh, and the programs that we had uh, in our school. 
So the key learning points is at this time, school uh, should be willing to design lessons or specific time to tackle students' well-being. I know that it is a stressful time, not only the students, but the teachers are also very stressed and parents are also very stressed. But uh, well-being is very important because uh, mental health uh, really matters. It's no use if the curriculum is on track, but the students are not uh, well taken care of mentally. And teachers and parents should also understand that it is crucial for them to support the well-being of the students, whether they are very young children or they're teenagers or they're in the, uh, uh, going to early adulthood. And a strong support system is really needed. At this point, it's uh, the parents uh, being the, uh, and the family members in the house. So this is a, uh, an example because a while ago I was mentioning that communication between parents and uh, children, especially when the kids uh, get into teenagers could be a little bit tricky. So we also want uh, to break the ice. We would like to melt the ice. We would like to break the barrier. So teachers collaborate with parents. Parents send love letter to their kids, of course, through Google form. Uh, they send it to the school so the school will uh, design an activity and then we will share the result of this love letter writing activity to the children so uh, in the so that children will also feel that oh my parents care so much about me so this is uh, an example so uh, the lessons here uh, maybe something that we can uh, learn together the first one is yeah if there are educators or teachers here I think it is important for us to manage the expectation related to academic matters. Uh, academic matters, of course, they're very important. We have objectives to attain. We also have scope and sequence to follow. But at this point, it is very difficult to force everything, especially with the younger learners. It will just be, it will just be stressing out uh, the people around the learners and the learning will not be fun and it's not going to make a, a positive impact on the students. So regarding the academic matters, uh, the expectation needs to be adjusted a little bit. And then the role of school counselors actually is very crucial at this time. We do not only wait until problem comes, then the counselor will uh, We'll meet the students, we'll counsel the students, but we can do preventive measures such as having regular uh, counseling, even though there's no case arising and designing programs, especially to uh, ensure that these students are well taken care of uh, mentally and to make sure that their well-being is okay. And then homeschool collaboration is of course very essential. It is always essential, but now it's becoming more and more important and it's crucial, especially with the children not being here in the school, the students are not in the school. So it's very important to have uh, the parents or the family and the school to collaborate to make sure for the betterment of the uh, students. So that practically sums up my uh, sharing for today. Thank you very much. And yeah, look forward to uh, exchanging ideas with you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. This is a marathon and not a sprint. So this is very sagely advice for all of us who are trying to make sense of the challenges that we encounter during this crisis. I'd like to call on David now to ask you a couple of questions, perhaps give you some reaction to your presentation. David. Please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Caroline, for sharing that. And I, I, I quote the same uh, statement that you made, uh, what Vicente has just also repeated, that learning life, is, this learning is not a sprint, but it's a marathon. And you use the concept learners, which I have also been trying to uh, reinforce the importance of understanding that uh, learning is indeed a lifelong process. It's not just only uh, the concept of uh, learning a particular subject, a fixed period of time. That's typically associated to students. Students have to learn a subject at a particular level. And then once you're done with it, you move on to the next stage. But you use the word learners and which really is so important in today's context and especially about, uh, you're talking about uh, the stress that the young children are going to get. 
So yes, I want to strongly encourage you to continue to use that concept. Concept of learners really imply learning beyond just only subject matter, but learning, as you mentioned, about the soul, about the social part, about being what a good citizen, uh, and also about holistic learning. There's one particular uh, question I want you to, um, or rather comment I want you to consider and think about. You did mention that you uh, design specific lessons on resilience for students. And you also have another intervention where you check on the well-being of the students, meaning that the teachers will call the, the students. Yeah? Um, I'm just wondering whether um, this care for students or taking into, in, into consideration students' own experiences, their feelings, and so on. Could it be weaved into uh, or, and also integrated into the everyday lesson? You know, you have many lessons throughout the day. You have many subjects, right? So instead of uh, designing a specific and carve out a specific time, you talk about resilience. Could, for example, resilience or experiences of stress and all those things, we weave into subject matter in the, in, in the classes so that you have a lot more time to talk about it and a lot more time to also learn, not just only content, but certainly learning about this, dealing with this kind of emotions. Your thoughts on that, Caroline? Thank you, David. Yes, mm, we agree that uh, it, is, uh, it should be an integrated uh, something to learn, yeah? that it's not just focusing on the lessons or specific time in a timetable. Yeah, uh, in my school, our counselors they have teaching hours. They conducted lessons called the personal and professional skills. Uh, that gives us some time to to address specific issues uh, related to the psychological development of the students and other things that they can discuss. The thing is, they initiate this program, but the execution need to go need to come from the other teachers as well so it's like the theme the big theme of the school okay this few months we will be discussing about this there are lessons about this but other teachers when you're even your even your teaching mathematics even your teaching other subject you still have to embed this uh, learning these values into into the daily life. After all, it's not a lesson that we need to memorize or learn or study like a, like to prepare for the exam, but it's more onto uh, a way of life. Yes, so I, I like that idea as well. Yes, and we, we will continue to move forward and to make sure that it is an integrated curriculum. And yes, even uh, without uh, the situation of this pandemic, I think this should be a continuous a continuous uh, practice that a school or other schools can also do to ensure that their students are well taken care of. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. I just have a suggestion of how you could also make this a little bit more systemic. Uh, you know, teachers are always driven by learning objectives. You have a list, you plan your lesson with learning objectives, yeah? And you always phrase the learning objectives in cognitive, effective, psychomotor. And of course, you have your content. And so actually, if you think, into, think about it, you could actually include one more objective, which is to you know, uh, invite the students to share their own experiences uh, related to, of course, to the topic in the class. So the additional objective is that to what extent, uh, for example, students are able to contribute their own experiences yeah, into the subject matter and so on. So that part of it here, when you put it into an objective, then teachers are more likely to say, yeah, I need to fulfill the objective. Yeah. yeah, that's a suggestion. Yes, thank you, David. That will also promote the, uh, our learners to become more reflective and also to take ownership of their learning. Yes. Thank you, David and Carolyn. We have time for um, one quick question for you, Caroline. So, Sherlene, Sherlene and Regina asked these questions. They're very related to each other. How do teachers detect anxiety and issues of depression on the part of students? That's what Shirley is asking. And Regina is also asking, it's related to that. In a context where you don't have guidance counselors, uh, how do you train teachers to be able to spot these? Uh, your thoughts about this, Caroline? Yes, thank you for the question. It's not an easy one, especially during this uh, distance learning, right? 
but we could always actually it comes with a quality observation but quality also comes from quantity so we need to spend time and to understand the pattern of the behavior of certain students first of all the chemistry and the connection needs to be built that's why it is difficult to do it actually uh, during this uh, remote learning it is difficult but it is not impossible so through conversations, actually what uh, we do in our school, we do the group counseling, we also do the personal counseling. So without any problems, and we don't only give counseling to people who have problems. So it's for everyone. So uh, it's not something that the students are trying to avoid. But in case if there are no guidance counselors in the school, actually teachers, we could always uh, pay more attention to the behavior of our students. I think from this uh, remote learning or distance learning, we could always, uh, we could detect somehow uh, their behavior, uh, their facial expression in the video cam or the way that they express or the way they answer questions or the way uh, the pattern of behavior, for example, the submission of an assignment or the way they uh, interact or uh, talk to their teachers that could always be a sign a hint yeah but then to dig deeper of course quality conversation needs to be done maybe uh, teachers can uh, schedule conversations with their students one-on-one -on -one, uh, to find out more about uh, how they feel thank you Caroline so quality conversations uh, that's really a, a very helpful piece of advice for all our colleagues we will now turn to um, David, our critical friend for this webinar, to share with us his thoughts, uh, his reactions to the presentations given by Jaida and Caroline. David? Yeah, thank you so much. Probably it's good for me to just also uh, uh, reiterate what both Jaida and Caroline have shared and the importance of uh, learning can still go on, even in a crisis such as this. While we are so away, we are so removed from each other's presence, but the social part of it is still can happen and so on. Now, what I want to share really very much is that to remind uh, ourselves as educators that learning can come in many different forms and different ways. Learning certainly can happen when you have a teacher teaching, and learning can also be done as an independent study. For example, when you're assigned for work, especially through remote learning. But there's also another aspect of it, which is learning can also be done in a social manner, even in a pandemic crisis such as this. So I just want to share with you two fantastic concepts that are, yeah, that will be useful for us to think through, especially when we talk about uh, learning and social wealth, learning about supporting one another, learning about uh, you know, uh, the well-being and so on, right? And this particular concept, activating students as learning resources, is taken from William's book, which is a very influential book about assessment for learning. Right? And so this concept is uh, understanding that teachers are not the only uh, sources of uh, learning and teachers are not the only people who should be responsible to teach or to make, make sure students learn. Right? Learning is uh, just to reinforce what Dewey says in 1963, yeah, the learning is a social activity. This, of course, uh, means that there need to be interaction. There need to be uh, one where a chance to be able to hear and listen to, of course, properly, not just only hearing, but listen to uh, intensely and also being able to share and uh, interact with each other. So even in this very challenging situation, uh, we definitely do miss the social interactions part, which we sometimes take for granted that it can happen in the classroom, it can happen in the school. But in today's context, when students are learning remotely, then there ought to be one where we have to be more purposeful in activating students as learning resources more on the social part. We can certainly do that, for example, using, uh, if you use Zoom uh, as one of the platforms, uh, pairing up students for a specific period of time so the students will be able to interact yes through the media through the through the through this through zoom as a platform uh, where the learning can carry on even remotely in a, 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 a pairing up or group activity kind of a situation right 
So this social activity, as I say, is very important because one is that students sometimes will feel that they are more open, more ready to share if their peers are there rather than having to raise a hand and uh, ask a question from teachers. So this uh, way of, of uh, purposeful thinking may require us to think about how do we translate or integrate cooperative learning into a remote learning situation? And it's possible. You could do that also. Uh, for example, the ability of um, the Zoom for breakout sessions. So that can be done where you have a purposeful grouping of the students, giving them some specific tasks, and uh, of course, uh, implementing the cooperative learning methodology. Yeah? So uh, the other aspect of it here is, of course, uh, students as learning resources, uh, as what Jaida has shared, is that if you have students who have gone through the same experiences, who are now more mature, who have also, of course, the ability to communicate in sign language, then therefore, um, activating them as learning resources to care for, or as a buddy to the younger students, will be something very important in these challenging times the stress the students go through, the challenges the students go through, the feelings of uh, being uh, alone in isolation certainly helps if there is somebody who say that, yes, I'm here and we're going through the journey together. Then, of course, uh, another aspect of uh, students as learning resources can be in the form of inclusive education. And I think Jaira's uh, school is a good example. 29% special needs, which means that uh, the mainstream students are the, the majority if there are some specific interventions of helping the mainstream students to have uh, some level of awareness of the challenges faced by the special needs students, that would be fantastic. For example, uh, subjecting the students to uh, go through a particular period of time where they have something over the ear which they can't hear, right? and then people giving them instructions and so on, Yeah, and then they will miss some important things like maybe rewards and so on, they may have misery, certain rewards. That will give them a certain level of awareness that, yeah, these are the challenges faced by our deaf students. And likewise too, of course, you can raise empathy and awareness of the challenges faced by blind students as well. So this form of activating students as learning resources is basically to expand the learning opportunities and the support system that we have in our school without having to over burden and over uh, pressure our teachers and the parents. The next concept is the concept of, of live-wide learning. And as I've shared just now um, with uh, Caroline that the concept of learners is a fantastic concept because it talks about one where learning continues and not just only happen in the classroom. Learning happens in the school, learning happens in the classroom, learning happens at home learning happen in the community and learning certainly will continue. And this is the important understanding that when students come into the learning setting, be it in a remote setting or in a classroom, they come with a whole host of experiences. And this is what is being defined as what we call life-wide learning. It's about the space where they learn from family, things that they have observed in the community, in the neighborhood, and of course, the religious settings and uh, yes, recreation, uh, music, street activities, media, and a whole host of these experiences. Students will have probably more time taking in this life-wide learning because it's on a daily basis. Yeah, they're subjected to opportunities to be exposed to, like I say, interactions and of course, experiences. And if we can think about this, is that they already have this breadth of experiences. And if you could integrate this, their experiences into the formal learning itself, then you find that the formal learning will definitely be much, much more enriched. So this concept of life work learning is really more about how do we integrate the experiences of students into uh, specific contents that we have designed. So if you can weave it in there, then you'll find that students have a voice. Students will, will be able to be more participative. But more importantly here is that if you, of course, design lessons where the 
experiences of students and of course the stress and, and, the, and the challenges that they are facing. If this can also of course from this live-wide learning experiences of theirs, you can weave it into the formal teaching and learning, you'll find that there will be better opportunities for students to uh, have their feelings being expressed and have their feelings being talked about and shared. And you have, of course, a community learning together, both, of course, among the students and, of course, if you can include parents as well. So I would like to certainly encourage um, all the presenters as well as all of us to think through the concepts where we can emphasize uh, and tap on opportunities of uh, students as learning resources and students' experiences where we can uh, address and also at the same time integrate into the curriculum itself. Thank you. David, thank you very much for helping us distill the inspiring messages that Jaida and Caroline have shared with us today. I really particularly like your quote that uh, learning goes on and then emphasizing the social nature that our learners are find themselves in and how we can tap into this. Um, I have, um, there's actually one of our participants wanted to ask you a question and I, and I think it's very relevant because it also is very helpful for our panelists as well. This is from Jing Ning. Um, Jing Ning says that uh, she was able to hear uh, the interventions that Jaida and Caroline have undertaken. What can be done by the system to institutionalize these individual efforts? I don't know if it's even possible yeah. since these are from two different systems. And then I think the other question that uh, Jing Ning asks is, work-life balance uh, in interventions that they're doing how can or what are your suggestions david that so that teachers can maintain work-life balance okay probably the first question first and this is something which uh, the national institute of education singapore is doing actively uh, all our uh, initial teacher preparation programs that means these are the teachers uh, being trained uh, or, or being prepared and developed so that uh, in the is it a bachelor's degree or is it a advanced uh, diploma and so on before they assume the role as uh, teachers in the school they will learn about how to handle diverse learners and i think it's important to uh, broaden this concept of uh, special needs and not just only with special needs but diverse learners as in ability some are low ability you know medium ability and so on how do you deal with them and certainly, of course, the special needs. So I think one way is to ensure that teacher training programs here will have some specific uh, programs and specific uh, uh, learning about how to handle these diverse learners. That's one important thing. I think the second important thing is that from a system perspective is that, and I think what Anjaida is also doing, Caroline is doing here, is that if progressively we make sure that we have a more inclusive education uh, practice in our system. Uh, of course, you know we, we know that some of these are really special needs and then they need a special equipment and special schools and special resources. But by and large, if you can define special needs as one where they can still be part of the mainstream, but maybe with some uh, specific way to teach and, 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 and help the students, then certainly inclusive education will be a fantastic uh, progress towards uh, uh, from a system perspective. The reason why we say that inclusive education is important is because we have to be reminded that uh, education is a social activity and this social activity involves real life. And though you may be special need, but you're still living in society. You're still living with people around you who are what we call mainstream. So of course, uh, you know, ability to uh, adapt and of course, certainly for the mainstream to be aware and, be, and, and, and also to understand is important. I think the second question about work-life balance, uh, I think um, yes, it's absolutely important and especially when we have online now and Zoom where the, the, the line between uh, doing work and uh, spending time with the family uh, is quite blur. But I, I do want to say that for all teachers, I think we have to understand that if we don't keep ourselves well enough, then we will not be 100% able to 
help others. That's one. Then the second thing is that don't forget teachers are also learners, not just only learners and students are learners. So in order for teachers to learn, a time set aside to think through, to reflect, to read, and all those things here, this time has to be guarded by the teacher. Because if we don't guard it, then it will be encroached into by all urgent matters. So I just want to say, for example, for myself personally, what I do practice here is that I got the time when I'm jogging for that 45 minutes to an hour. That's just me jogging and then just the pavement. And so I use that time really for my own reflection, my learning. So that's an example. If teachers can find their own ways that they can do their learning and reflection, that's a big step towards what we call work-life balance of being an effective teacher. Yeah. Thanks, Vicente. Thank you very much, David. We now open up um, our session for our panel discussion. And first of all, I'd like to thank all our participants, our attendees for the questions that they have submitted. So let me start off from a question from Facebook Live. Um, if you're aware, Zoom has a, has a limited capacity, relatively limited capacity. So we have an overflow and they're watching us from Facebook Live. From, for, so Bam Smith from Facebook Live is asking this question to all our panelists and David, our critical friend. What alternatives do you recommend or have you tried out in trying to assess students' learning abilities, particularly during the time of the pandemic? I think what Bam is saying is, is that since we don't actually see them in the classroom, what practical measures have you undertaken to try to look at uh, determining whether the students are learning. Maybe we can start with Jaida, followed by Caroline, and then we move to David. Thank you, Sir Anteng. Basically, what they can access is the Facebook Messenger. Okay, this is really how we can assess them, informally or formally. This is very basic, okay? Especially those who have no laptop at home, very limited internet connection and gadget. Messenger is the best way to assess them. Okay, sending them the test and then through uh, video call, it's easy to detect. We don't have to be specifically following rules, you know, verbatim. Okay. Thanks, Jada. Caroline? Thank you. So assessment can take in many forms, I believe. So yeah, in terms of like this uh, remote learning, we are a little bit advantaged by the technology and yeah, like there are also some examination platform with surveillance camera. They, are, they're, they exist out there. Uh, some of them are free for the teachers to use. You can use that. You could also use um, Google, yeah, Google Classroom, uh, Google Form to assess as a formative assessment or uh, as a summative assessment. But yeah, assessment is like, uh, it can take many forms. It can be through conversation. It can be through a product or a presentation of the students. So we could always uh, uh, use many forms. For the younger learners, that's why homeschool collaboration is very important. Sometimes uh, we need to recheck uh, with the parents or the adults at home. Are the learning objectives uh, attained? Are the kids doing what is uh, what they're supposed to be learning? So yeah, those are the channels for assessments. Thank you, Caroline. Before I ask David to respond, I am being reminded by our friends that it's, uh, it's time for me to share the results of the poll that we asked earlier. Um, so let's take a look at what the results were. So the question, if you recall, is how best can we extend care to young people during crisis? So regularly communicating with and directly address issues, troubling students had the biggest share, 68%. This is followed by prioritizing the well-being of learners over and above academic progress, 47%. Increasing engagement with parents follows with 36%. And then a few of our participants have stated that they're confused and are unsure of what steps to take. So I'd like to thank all our participants for participating in this poll and for telling us what you think about this question, how best we can extend care to young people during the crisis. Let's now uh, ask David to respond to that original question. Yeah, I think tips. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think Caroline has given a very good, a very succinct, comprehensive understanding of our assessment. So various ways, yeah. 
I, I'm not going to add to it, and it's going to take a long, long time to go into <laughs> deep into it. But I just want to share something uh, of um, the things that I'm doing here and some possibilities for us as we think and look, look ahead. Um, this particular uh, pandemic has actually uh, increased a lot more digital footprints of students. Yeah, so when you leave digital footprints, then you leave so-called evidences all over. Which, uh, so what I'm doing actually is to mine those evidences huh, that you leave behind uh, in terms of, for example, in discussion, and even in this recording. Yeah, so we, we, we have this. So what I'm doing is to um, build models to do text mining video from video you transcribe into text. You mine for uh, specific things. Like for example, one of the projects that I'm doing now is to develop a model to mine ideas. So we often talk about, you know, students, uh, you know, yes, your subjects, your subject contents, but I'm also interested to develop students, uh, not just of the mind, not just of the soul part, but it's also about, are they ready to be incorporated into the world of the, you know, in, in, this, in, this, in this emerging world? where you have technology driving it, you have, of course, a lot of changes in jobs and so on. So preparing students to be future ready involves one of the things that I'm doing here, is that I want to find out whether the students, uh, you know, uh, uh, have, whether students have a habit of coming up with ideas. So the model, for example, I'm, I'm building on now is able to mine text and be able to identify root words and expansion of root words and, uh, all this. So that's a form of assessment that is actually tapping on to the digital footprints that students leave behind, forums and discussion in recordings and so on. So uh, yeah, I know that I'm venturing into an area where it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy to understand, but I'm just suggesting that you may not necessarily have the technical expertise to do it, but certainly people are out there who have the expertise, but we as educators, we can tell them this is what we want. And of course, the experts in the, the modeling itself, they will be able to help us look into this. Thank you, David. Questions for both Caroline and Jada, Jada. And this is from Evelyn, Merv, and Sharel. I've combined their questions because they are very, there's a lot of overlap. Um, what activities can you provide to students, learners who are bored and stressed during the pandemic? Specifically, do you have any tips about reading? for kids during the pandemic. That's from Merv and earlier from Evelyn. And from Sharel, what is the biggest challenge that you have encountered in preparing students for learning during the pandemic? Um, let's start with Caroline this time and move to Jaida. And then if David has some suggestions, of course, we would love to hear what these are. So essentially, how, what are the biggest challenges? And if you have specific tips in relation to reading and for boredom among your young learners. Caroline, please. Yes, thank you, Vicente. When we talk about young learners, they are not best friends with uh, remote learning. Yeah, it's a total, uh, we could say that it's quite a total chaos, especially at home. Yeah, uh, the parents are also having very difficult time to engage their children uh, in the distance learning or so-called remote learning. So uh, there is one thing that we're planning to do in the school, but we haven't, but we haven't done it. So we would like to open a, uh, something like an interest club, like a hobby club that the kids can go online without having to just discuss lessons. So I think in the beginning of this pandemic, uh, going online uh, for learning is still something very cool because the students didn't experience it before. They were very excited. But after some time, again, it's a marathon, they get very bored. So an interest club could be, uh, could be uh, based on their interest, for example. Example, oh, Harry Potter fans, uh, we could go online and discuss about this, or, or pet lover. So we could also do that. At least that, that provides a little refreshing experience uh, in the midst of the boring uh, distance learning. That is the one thing that we're trying to do. And then um, uh, for young learners, of course, again, uh, the parental engagement or anyone at home is very important, is very needed. Sometimes the teachers are already performing like a clown. The kids also don't care. This is something that you cannot avoid. But the biggest challenges that we encounter during this uh, 
we call it home-based learning or remote learning is uh, the student's engagement. That's right, because uh, it's very hard to touch them. It's very hard to connect with them. And sometimes if they just simply do not go online, especially bigger students always have excuses starting from the internet connection until whatever it is. So uh, that's the biggest challenges. That's why, again, uh, why uh, cooperation with the parents is very important that uh, we could check is it really internet connection or is it just the child avoiding uh, the lessons? Thank you, Vicente. Thank you, Caroline. Jaida? For those children who don't have internet access, we send them books. We have a lot of reading books in the library which are just displayed here. No one is reading. So we send them at home through uh, using our school service, but we lend them. We, we let them sign a waiver that it is just borrowed. And then for those who have the internet access, we send them interactive learning materials or ebooks for them to read. Okay. But for those special, uh, the special learners, of course, they in, they're, they're engaged with this already. Okay. You just have to send them regularly because they get bored easily. Okay. The biggest challenge I have in this pandemic, uh, going through different barangays and cities because most of my special learners are living outside Quezon City, Philippines. So traveling to the area to seek special permits from the barangay, the mayor, that is very tasking. Just delivering them food packs, you need to get them, you know, one or two days. But it, does, it, it, it doesn't cost me any problem because it's done. Okay? The, attention, the attention span of those learners during the internet uh, online moments you still have to at least one or one and a half hours enough for them because they, they will really shut off the camera. They will not listen to you anymore. So you have to make use of those of that time talking to them, you know, listening to them. That's the biggest challenge I experienced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaida. David, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, I, I think um, from a systems perspective, uh, we could certainly have to motivate students to learn uh, more in, extrinsically. Uh, Caroline's son is a fantastic, it's about intrinsic. Yeah. But certain reward system you can build in, into, into our library system, for example, is when students read a number of books and so on, then collect a certain deck of cards and these cards are itself not just only something attractive, but you can learn more about uh, like creatures or insects, life cycles and all those things. So um, the, the idea behind this is that uh, extrinsic motivation, such as uh, the deck of cards and so on, could probably be supported by um, uh, organizations out there and not necessarily from the school. And I'm sure if you make this appeal to communities, there could possibly be more of this uh, willingness to partner the school in encouraging students to learn by using this extrinsic reward, like deck of cards here. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, there are several more questions that we're gonna be going through. Um, Eva and Maria have asked a question about connectivity uh, issues, I think, and we've talked about that, um, internet connectivity. Um, one question that is not asked, but I'd like to, to squeeze in here as, as moderator is, I wonder what all three of you think about um, space, I mean, it's a screen time for young learners because we're looking at young learners. We're now in a digital learning environment. What guidelines do you have or do you even have guidelines that you share with teachers and parents in relation to screen time for young learners? Maybe we can start with uh, Jaida, Caroline, and then David. Yes, the Department of Education in the Philippines have uh, uploaded the, uh, the number of hours that the student should be online. So all teachers, school heads should follow that. So it's institutionalized for us. What is it actually, Jada? What did, do you remember what the, what the limit is? For example, for the kinder level, it should be at least one hour only. Right. So grades one to four, at least one and a half hours. And then it's five and six. And so on high school, at least four three to four hours like that. Perfect. Thank you, China. But it's institutionalized for us. Right. Caroline? Yeah, I think it's more or less the same. We try to provide breaks in between so that the kids' eyes will not be strained 
they can have some time off the screen, but actually the suggested screen, uh, screen time uh, actually not only refers to the online learning, yeah? Sometimes when, they're, when it's the break time, they're also in front of the screen playing some games or watching TV. Actually, it's almost the same. Yeah, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest setback for this online learning is really children's exposure to the screen. I think it's really too much right now and it's uh, really difficult uh, to avoid. And yeah, uh, there's nothing much that we can do. We only can like set some breaks uh, for the students and uh, give them tasks that don't always require them to do it in front of the computer so that they can always take some time off the screen. Thank you, Caroline. David, would you have some comments about this? No, I think what Caroline and Jaina has shared, uh, they covered most of this already. When there is some more purposeful and timely intervention by teachers to direct students away from there, from the screen. And also, of course, I think what Caroline suggested is an excellent one, which is make sure that we can set tasks that require them to move their eyes away from the screen and look at other things and start working on, for example, paper, you know, and so on. Yeah, I guess these are important uh, interventions that could be done by the teachers. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. Um, one question that comes from uh, Maria Cecilia and from Marcos. Uh, Maria Cecilia says, and this is for um, Caroline, Jaida, maybe David can also comment on this, is this notion of a psychosocial first aid that, um, that the schools offer to students, also to parents, if you actually offer this sort of uh, uh, looking out for the total well-being of school stakeholders. Uh, and then Marco says that there's been reports of self-harm in different countries. And he was wondering whether, uh, whether in Indonesia specifically, what does Carolyn, what do the schools do in addressing issues related to self-harm you know, or really the well-being of all the stakeholders in our school? Mm -hmm. Let's start with you, Caroline. Move to Jaida and then David, please. Okay. Yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. And that is something that is really in front of our eyes. Not only self-harm, self-harm is usually a form of, say, uh, depression. Yeah, that's why they don't, they feel the pain. They don't know how to, they don't know how to express it. That's why they uh, resort to harming themselves, wishing to divert the pain inside to outside. So uh, regular counseling, again, uh, what I would like to reiterate is for teachers, educators, counselors to also lend uh, an ear to the students and not only waiting until this, uh, uh, this thing to happen. Uh, it has to be a prevention, uh, preventive measures when we connect with the students. Sometimes it's true that during teenage years, yeah, I think self-harm will will most likely to come up in teenage years. Yeah? It's not very likely to be done by very, very young children. Uh, when they're getting older, they start to have a certain kind of frustration or depression. It's very important that they have not only a critical friend, but also a supportive friend. And this could be, if not the peer support, it could be an adult, either the school teacher or the counselor. So yeah, uh, how to address it? Of course, it's better to prevent it, but if it happens, then uh, we have to seek for a professional, professional help to, to deal with this matter. I think that's for me. Thank you, Caroline. Jaida? Uh, as of this moment, lucky for me, I don't have such thing in my school, but if ever I will have that. Um, a lot of psychosocial webinars are be, have been provided to teachers and parents. And there are still scheduled webinars for them on the following months. Maybe this can help them, but if it happens in reality then, then uh, maybe a strict guidelines should be implemented then. Uh, we'll cross the bridge when, we're, when we get there. David? Uh, yes, from the same concept of activating students as learners, we can think about activating community partners as uh, support resources as well. Recently in Singapore, the Samaritans of Singapore uh, held a one-week emphasis on uh, teen suicide, which actually has been on the rise because of the COVID and so on. So this kind of partnership with uh, the wider community and organizations will definitely be useful 
because otherwise the schools will not be able to just uh, deal with all this by uh, themselves. So as I say, is that as long as we continue to know that they are help available through these many different kinds of communities and organizations, then that should be made aware and should be one where there's a more purposeful partnership so that we can deal with this together as a society. Yeah. Thank you, David. Perhaps you have time for uh, one more question and I'm going to read out uh, uh, questions from Bettina, uh, Terence, and also from uh, Zuli Stewanti, right? So Bettina asks, she's actually, it's almost like a reflection. She's saying that um, this pandemic may have long-term effects on our young people, uh, particularly because, um, because of the distancing that is required. Uh, as David mentioned, it has to be something social. Learning is something social. So I wanted you to, to reflect on this. Have you had a chance to sit down and talk to your colleagues and say, what can we do to try to mitigate whatever negative effects or ill effects might happen to our kids during this prolonged period of forced isolation? When I say isolation, being away from their colleagues. That's from Bettina. And then something related to that is from Terence. Given that situation, how do we best manage the resources that we have available to build resilience among our young learners? On the one hand, what are the effects that this pandemic might lead to? And then what can we do in order to build their resilience? Um, perhaps we can start, David, is it right if we start with you and then we move on to Jaida and Caroline? Yeah, I, I think um, the assumption that it will have a long-term effect uh, may not be uh, fully um, have evidence of that yet because we are still into this about nine months into this particular crisis. And also I think we don't have enough studies and evidence to point out indeed the effects of it. But one of the things that we can learn from history is that uh, children especially are a lot more resilient than we can give them credit for. And so um, we strongly believe that if parents can play the role of helping students and children, of course, to voice their feelings and so on, this will definitely be part of the support system within the family and, of course, within the school itself to help students here to weather this particular storm. I think the other aspect of it here is that um, when it comes to um, uh, Dealing with the, the, the emotions and the social well-being part of students here and the social part of learning here is that within each jurisdiction, country, city, and so on, with the uh, specific rules, we can definitely leverage on those rules. Say the rules say that we can only have five students, right? And so therefore design activities for the five students and certainly encourage a ch your child to join that particular five students group. And so, as I say, is to we live and work and plan according to, of course, the rules by the jurisdiction. And I think that's probably a better way rather than keep them away. Yeah. Thank you. Jaida. Thank you, David. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, regular virtual meetings with teachers and learners will somehow help them understand that we are one in this fight. You know, if you really have to follow government rules and protocols, maybe someday, somehow, we can get rid of this virus. We can go out freely from the world. You know. uh, but for the meantime, we have to really let them understand through a series of meetings, listening to them, that this is not an, an issue to, to just neglect. You know. We have to really fight this together. Thank you, Jaida. Caroline? Uh, we did have uh, some conversation with the colleagues. Yeah, what will come after this pandemic? What do you worry most? We were actually thinking because teenagers, they are developing their social skills. They learn to build connection in their brain also on how to interact with people. And when they interact with people through the facial expression or through the gesture, they learn to socially interact with others. What we fear the most is probably the, the phenomenon of social anxiety after, after this long uh, lockdown period that uh, you were in isolation. Yes, they chat. They have uh, chatting with their friends all day long, but chatting doesn't have emotion. You don't detect emotion. You have emoji only. Yes, emoticons. But, but you, don't, you don't learn, oh, I should stop talking. I should 
continue or my 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 uh, my friend uh, seems of uh, from the face it doesn't seem that she likes what I said so I should rephrase my sentence or what we don't learn that through chatting so what we're afraid they could be awkward socially they don't know how to uh, interact very well uh, with their friends but yeah uh, that's why even virtual meetings sometimes they refuse to turn on their camera of course children teenagers they start to be conscious they don't want to see how their friends see them they they're fearful about it so they prefer to turn off their video but actually it's a it's a way of learning to learn other people's facial expression so that is one thing that we we would like to be we do not want that to happen but we would like to be ready if uh, someday that happens then uh, as an institution maybe we could also design certain programs or to facilitate uh, the social interaction uh, when the time comes and to build resilience yeah uh, what resources that we have of course resilience is also uh, something that is connected uh, with the growth mindset focusing on something that we can control, focusing on the positive. So some of the exercises that the students can do, actually, they can do like a gratitude journaling, to be thankful for what they have. Instead of uh, bombarding them with the news outside, how many cases today here in Indonesia, uh, we could focus and uh, focus uh, on the positive things and also ask them to do something meaningful to do uh, to share food with the people nearby to think about uh, something that they can do instead of uh, dwelling on something that they cannot control so that's uh, practically some of the things that we could really actually do with our students thank you very much caroline and with that we end our our q a with all the panelists and our critical friend and that also essentially concludes our third webinar. So thank you very much, uh, panelists. Thank you, critical friend, Professor David Ang, and thank you for all our participants. But don't go yet because I'm going to be calling on Vignesh as we wrap up uh, the lessons that we have learned in relation to the three-part webinar series that we have just completed, leadership in, educational leadership in times of a crisis. And actually, I'd like to ask Vignesh one specific question. Uh, if, if you could kindly bring us back to what motivated uh, you and the Head Foundation to undertake this program? What, was, what were the objectives that you wanted to, to accomplish then? Vignesh? Thank you, Vicente. When we first thought about this, uh, when the pandemic first struck and all of us were caught flat-footed, we were shocked, we were surprised. Uh, we, we were wondering what we could do. So over the years, the Head Foundation has done its best and done what it could to contribute to the development of educational leadership in Southeast Asia. And through our interactions with educational leaders, we realized how important it is and very often not given the sufficient attention uh, that it rightly deserves. So during the pandemic, one of the first things they wanted to do was to catch up with uh, some of our alumni participants. Uh, everyone, as, as you are very aware, and I'm sure our audience now know, uh, all the principals who have been talking to us over the last three weeks uh, took part in uh, the Certificate in Educational Studies in Leadership Program. And so what we wanted to do was to speak with our Filipino participants who we had just left uh, towards the end of last year. I want to catch up with them, see how they are doing and what's been happening. And this was something that we did at the start of the pandemic. And talking to them was just inspirational. Uh, you know, we, we scheduled to have one call with them to, to learn what they've been doing, what, what the challenges they're facing and how they were overcoming the pandemic. And what we ended up having were two calls because we just didn't have enough time to listen to the amazing work that they were doing. And we realized that there was this wealth of knowledge. There was this great amount of activity that was happening among school, le school leaders, particularly uh, school leaders that we knew in the Philippines and Indonesia who were doing such great things to improve uh, their educational outcomes to help their teachers, their community and their learners during the crisis. So we thought, what can we do to share this with the wider community? So that was the genesis of the webinar series. And then both of us got speaking and we started to realize that uh, 
yeah, we, we had some amazing work that these principals were doing. And it was important that the wider community had an opportunity to listen, to engage with them. And our critical friends were able to lend their uh, knowledge, their experience, their wisdom to what was uh, being discussed. So that was the genesis. That was the reason behind why we did it. But uh, Vicente, maybe I can turn around and ask you this. As we were originally conceiving this idea, we then sort of uh, decided on these three categories of community, mobilizing your community, uh, nurturing your staff and caring for your students. Uh, would you like to share a little bit how and what, what motivated us to have these uh, three categories and how they could um, inform us during this uh, event? Yeah, thank you, Vignesh. Um, looking at the experiences of our colleagues in Indonesia, in the Philippines, what was happening in Singapore and what I was seeing happening in Australia and also in the United Kingdom where I'm now currently based, I really saw that uh, the school itself, that the concept of school needed to be interrogated and needed to be questioned. And I thought that the opportunity to undertake a three-part webinar series focusing on what I identified as three themes that need to be questioned, investigated, and interrogated was really important. So we wanted to start with the school being a building that we find in a community or in what Jaida said in a barangay. A barangay in the Philippines is the local community unit, right? Um, the typical notion that a school is independent and away from the community, I think needs to be really questioned. That's why our first theme was harnessing, building the community. We wanted to make sure that uh, the school would be able to work with the community. So in that first webinar series we had, we were really blessed to have a, a division superintendent, someone who was not a school principal, but someone who had a senior position in the bureaucracy. And that was uh, Dr. Ronaldo Pozon, who handled close to uh, 10,000 schools in, in his uh, division, almost around that number, right? Primary schools and secondary schools. Yeah. And he talked to us about uh, the trifocal initiatives that they were doing in their school. That was really impressive because here we see how the school was being created in such a way that it's no longer a building, but really a, yeah. an, a whole society effort. I know we had Sophie Andy, uh, our uh, dynamic principal from Jakarta, who told us about the importance of collaboration, communicating, and connecting with relevant stakeholders in, in, in the community. Finally, we had our critical friend, Hyron, uh, uh, who warned us about the pitfalls of professional learning, but also told us about the potential power that we could harness from professional learning community. So that was, I think we were able to, to carefully ask the questions about, about the school and the need for it to mobilize the community. Did you have additional learning points from that, Vignesh? Perhaps yeah, I think the, what came uh, across to me very um, clearly during this uh, webinar, the first one, was observing the efforts that were put in to build the sense of community, build this relationship long before the pandemic. And I think that's in, very important. And, and when Dr. Pozon had shared, even though he was new to this role, I think his predecessors had worked on it and he himself had spent a lot of time building these relationships. Um, it's difficult to build relationships in a crisis and it's important that we have these strong relationships. And when you talk about learning communities, I think that's another intriguing point because sometimes we think of professional learning and we talk about this more in the second webinar. It's very much school centric, but you're a cluster of schools, you're a division of schools. And there's so much to be learned from each other. Sometimes if we learn from just our peers in our own school, we may not get as rich an experience as we were if we were to discuss with colleagues from other schools, from within the division, who are facing their own unique set of challenges. So that came across to me as a very important point. And what I'm sharing on the screen now was the outcome of the, or the results of the poll that we conducted during the first session. And I think, you know, the, the, the Huge issue here is really the technological problem, the infrastructure, the lack of a stable internet connectivity, cell signal and hardware. 
And this is where the community can contribute so much. Uh, we can tap on community resources. We can seek the support, the help of community, of benefactors who could support it, of government and offic uh, officials who are able to lead the charge in some of these improvements. And I hope that the pandemic gives some deep thought into the kind of investments that a lot of these communities need to make uh, in the infrastructure upgrade that would allow us to tide over uh, future pandemics. So we moved to the second session just last yes, week on the yeah, 17th yeah. of September, um, where we had uh, uh, three, once again, three amazing speakers. And I'll, I'll let you, Vicente, share a little bit about your thoughts before I respond. Yeah, so we had our first webinar really was about um, mobilizing the community. And I was interrogating the, the role of the school as an isolated building. It shouldn't be. It should be a community effort. And we're seeing it really starkly during the pandemic where people are helping out in making the school function. And the other thing that I wanted that I hope we could all interrogate was the school being a factory model, this, which is a mm -hmm. product of the post Fordist notions of what schooling mm -hmm. is. And, um, and I think in order for us to deconstruct this idea that the school is a factory where kids go through different levels, was for us to refocus our, our perspective on the people who work in schools uh, and that we need to nurture the people in the schools, nurturing our staff. So that was really what our webinar theme was for, for the second one. And we had Domingo Lozande from the Philippines who calls himself a millennial school leader. And he, he talked about camaraderie and he talked about how his painful experiences beginning as a teacher, he channeled these and to make sure that the people that he was now supervising, he was handling, that he would care for them. So that was really remarkable. Uh, and then we had um, Diana Bensi, the school director from Jakarta, who spoke about building relations and nurturing these relations with and among school stakeholders. And she even talked about how on regular occasions, they would send out tiny trinkets of gifts, mm -hmm. letters to their teachers who were isolated in different parts of Jakarta, in different parts of Java. So these are really specific ways in which uh, these practitioners really try to nurture their staff. And then Alan Walker, our critical friend for the second webinar, he really shared with us compelling ideas, compelling insights on how we could refocus all our efforts to take care of the people who we work with. And one of the most powerful phrases that he shared with us then is this idea of school leaders becoming pragmatic visionaries, uh, taking a look at the resources they have, taking a look at the challenges that they face, and then seeking out what best option to undertake, but not forgetting the importance of highlighting the well-being and the welfare of teaching staff, of mm -hmm. their teachers. I thought that was, really, that was really very insightful on the part of Alan. What were your thoughts, Vignesh, on that second webinar? I, I have to agree. I think uh, Alan did share, and it's important that it's sort of a mental model, right? That teachers are our partners. They're not just our staff. They're not just cogs in a wheel. They're genuine partners. And they're not just their professional abilities, but their well-being as individuals is very important. I think what really inspired me from our two principals was hearing Domingo share of his own challenges as a young teacher and how he was determined not to replicate uh, the, the problems that he faced as a young teacher and to ensure that the young teachers who work for him today have a much better experience. I think that was genuinely inspirational. Uh, not being an, an educational leader myself, but being in a position of leadership, I think it is very important that we internalize, we understand the challenges that we may have faced and do our level best to try to ensure that those who come after do not face similar challenges. I think that was genuinely inspirational. And from uh, Vensi, I think what was so important was the same that came across in the earlier webinar. The idea of building a sense of camaraderie, a sense of community among her colleagues was something she had been doing for a very long time. It was something that she had been working on and putting her energy towards even before the pandemic. So when the pandemic struck, when everybody was caught flat-footed, when everybody was struggling, 
there was already the sense of community. There was the support network among the teachers, among the educators. There was a genuine sense of trust between the various stakeholders and her. Uh, her teachers, her, her educators knew that they could trust her, that they could lean on her. I, I think she also expressed how her board and, and uh, her management were able to, to work closely with her. And she had a strong level of trust, so they knew that she, the school was in good hands and the challenges that she highlighted were real. And also talking about the, the poll that was conducted, I think once again, you know, it sort of reflects what we came across in the first webinar where the printing, planning, development and printed materials to reach students without internet access was the real focus of a lot of the schools that the educators who participated in the webinar shared during this period. And once again, I think this speaks about the, the issues, the infrastructure issues that were faced. But what did also uh, entice me, or not, not entice, but uh, intrigued me were the three other results that came very close. The acquisition of soft skills, becoming familiar with modified assessment processes, and enhancing the technological skills. And I think all three of them broadly talk about really, particularly the, the second, the latter two, uh, talk about really navigating this new space, technology. And as you talked about, you know, the, the, the thinking behind this session was really questioning the traditional model of education, a model that has been around, in, in my opinion at least, uh, for too long, uh, a model that needs to be rethought. And a lot of conversations been happening around this industry 4.0, how the, the education system has to evolve. And I think the pandemic has forced us to rethink a lot of this. The assessment methods that we have become so accustomed to, do these still work? Are these still relevant? Are they training our, our children for what the future holds? Or are we preparing them for something that is no longer going to be around? And I think that it, it came across quite clearly. You know, it forced us to embrace technology the pandemic has forced us to learn from home. It has forced us to embrace technology. It has forced us to look at education differently. And it, it comes across also in, in these uh, uh, poll, poll results that we got. But in the interest of time, I do not want to take too long. So I'm going to just quickly move to our, our last session, today's session, and maybe hear some of your thoughts, uh, Vicente. I, I think we had a fantastic session. It was inspirational as always. Uh, but were there specific learning points for you that you came across from this session? Absolutely, Vignesh. So the, this third theme, caring for your students, for me, I think this is the most critical of all the issues in relation to schooling. Uh, I mean, I talked about the school as an isolated institution. We need to rethink that. School factory model, we need to question that. One of the lingering issues in, in, in schools in education is the inequality that happens among learners. It happens in developing nations, it happens in developed nations, and the pandemic has accentuated these inequalities. So I was very, very pleased to hear our panelists, Jaida, talking about the preferential option that she was pushing for learners with disabilities, and also for Caroline, our school principal from Jakarta, talking about the specific and deliberate steps that they were doing to prioritize and to make sure that the well-being of their students and teachers were taken care of. And then it was really heartening to hear David talk about the idea that learning still goes on and that the social linkages that the students experience is something that can be harnessed. I think one question that, um, that I hope all of us are able to think about is have, how can we learn from this pandemic, which has really accentuated inequalities that continue to exist today in our young learners. Some are disadvantaged, some are advantaged, some have uh, available resources, some do not. These are questions I think that uh, were touched upon by the practical efforts that our school leaders were undertaking in the respective jurisdictions. Vignesh, do you I, want I, to add something? Yes. No, I cannot agree more with what you're saying. And I think it, it, one of the things that came across very uh, clearly, especially uh, with our two principles, is the idea of leading by example. I think neither of them expected anything from their educators and even from their students that they were not prepared to do. 
And I think that is a very, very important part of education. But I also like to just paraphrase uh, the quotation that Jaida shared from the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, education is more than an entry point to the job market, and often that is how we have seen it. But truly, education can be transformational. It's not just about employability, it is also about changing lives and shaping the future. So just to refresh for our audience members, the results of uh, the poll that we conducted today, uh, we won't discuss this too much, uh, both in the interest of time and that we just spoke about it. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, not just our partner, the Head Foundation, but a very dear friend, Vicente Reyes, who shares the Head Foundation's same vision of uh, educational leadership as a critical uh, part of a successful education system uh, for agreeing to moderate uh, this session, this three, the three webinars that we have um, conducted over the last uh, three weeks. And I also like to thank uh, today's three speakers, David, Jaida and Caroline. Thank you for once again inspiring all of us. And I see within our audience many of the previous speakers. So thank you very much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have to bring this session to a close. Uh, I would just like to make one administrative point. Uh, there have been many requests about the issuance of certificates. Now, the certi there will be a link posted in the chat box. Please click the chat box right now, and you will see a link uh, that would allow you to apply for a certificate. So if you have attended all three of the webinar sessions and wish to receive a certificate of attendance, please click on that link, register, and let us know, and we will follow up with the necessary there will also be a recording of this session uh, posted on our website, uh, headfoundation.org. Please visit, watch the video if there's anything there that you feel is beneficial, enjoy it. Finally, one of the, the outputs of this webinar series that the Foundation has been working on together with our extremely eminent speakers and our moderator is a little booklet, a booklet that is a handbook for school leaders in the region, something that they can refer to especially during these times of crisis that will help them navigate the challenges and the constantly changing landscape. So I hope when the book is ready, we'll reach out to you. And I hope if you're interested and enjoy the, the booklet, please do share it with your colleagues and let us know if we can disseminate it further. But on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And on behalf of the Head Foundation, we'd like to thank you for being a part of this webinar series. And I hope you have found the webinar to be inspirational, to be educational, and most importantly, to be transformational. I look forward to welcoming you to future webinar series. But on that note, goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs>